All right. Uh, we're going to do a question and answer. And if anybody has questions, Tim is going to choose. So the pressure's off of me. Thank you. Uh, my question is, if we listen to the same teaching and listen to our teacher over and over again, multiple lifetimes, how do we change our minds and thoughts and actions? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, the question was, if we listen to our teacher over and over again, especially in multiple lifetimes, then how do we actually change our thoughts and actions? And there's a thing called trepto. Uh, which is uh, my, one of my teacher's favorite expressions. Uh, Trepto means, uh, his example was if a kid acts up. He was a school teacher in the refugee camp, so he, he got stuck with the elementary school. And uh, he wrote the textbooks for the elementary schools. And uh, so he said, there's a kind of a bad kid when you correct them, uh, they don't improve, and then you correct them again, and then you correct them again, and then tempto means they get used to correct. Correction from my teacher was hitting you with a mala on the head, uh, hitting you with a rosary on the head, and then he said some kids, they just get to where they don't mind the rosary on the head anymore, and they just get used to it, and then he, he would say that's a great danger. Uh, like your teacher's trying to correct you, and you get used to the correction, and then you learn to live with the correction and not correct yourself. And uh, so there is such a thing as chapto. And uh, I think for me, when I went, this was a famous conversation with my teacher, and I was fortunate to live with my teacher for 25 years. And uh, so that was a unique training school. I was the only foreigner who survived in his residence. And many, many were sent away and other bad things. So, uh, so I remember I, I went to him. I asked him this question. I asked him almost all the questions you can think of. And uh, he said, uh, I said, what if, what if you keep correcting me and I get used to the correction, and I don't correct myself. And then you keep repeating the same correction, and then I don't change. And then I get immune to your corrections, to where I don't hear them anymore. And he said, oh, uh, that's not a problem. And I'm like, what do you mean it's not a problem? He says, suffering, suffering. I'm like, what? He said, the world will crush you. The world will bring you new problems, you know. The world will give you some terrible things will happen to you, and then you'll come and listen to me, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. He says, you don't have to do anything. Just be alive, and uh, the world will bring you new problems, and then you'll come back to me, and then you'll listen, you know. So, so you don't have to do anything. Just live. And uh, life, will, life itself will remind you that, that you have to listen to your teacher. And, and, and I'm, it's, it's not facetious. I'm not just saying it as a joke or something. It's really true. So, but the, the, the trick is to stay in contact or contactable with your teacher. So, you know, if you don't, you, there's times when you kind of uh, spend time away from your teacher. Uh, but always have that option set up that you can get in touch with your teacher or you can get back to them and ask them for their help like that. So don't, don't burn the bridge. You know, keep, the, keep the option open uh, to get help from them when you need them. You know. Life will remind you. you, don't, you if you're really smart, you can anticipate what life's going to do. But... Very few people can do that. You, know, you can guess by observing other people getting old or, you know, dying. 
or getting cancer, you can guess that it's going to happen to you. So if you're really intelligent, you can work ahead of the game and, and be in touch with your teacher. But if you're just a normal person, you can wait till you get cancer and then you... But be in touch with your teacher so when the time comes, you can, you can get help, okay? That's the main thing. So it's kind of like just be alive and things will... The connection will be remade when, it, when you need it. Okay. And that's happened in my life. I've, I have many, many students over the course of my life. And, and they come back, they have a challenge, and they, come, they get sick or something happens, and they, they come back, and that's okay. And then we reconnect, and, and I wake up all the old teachings, and it's fine. It works out. So it's okay. Mr. Tim. You got me. Thanks. All right. This is a question that came online actually last week on our Facebook page. Um, a friend of ours, she, is, her mother got really sick during COVID and wasn't able to fly to Mexico as she was passing away, even though her mom had asked her to be able to do so. And it, and it turned out that her mother passed away before she was able, able to go and wasn't able to be there with her. And it's brought her a lot of deep grief. And she wanted to know how she could think about this and what advices might you have, even though she wasn't able to be there, that maybe that could help her as her mother had transitioned. Yeah, cool. Uh, so this happens to, to many of us. And... Uh, it happened to me, and uh, I took care of my real mom as she was dying. And uh, actually, my teacher asked, advised me to bring her to take teachings in uh, in the Himalayas, and she came. She was already uh, very, very ill with cancer in her brain, and she came for I think two two months or three months and listen to teachings, uh, but I, I couldn't be there when she died. Uh, so I know the question, and um, what I would say, there's a practice that my teacher taught me. People used to come uh, to him and say, my, my mom passed away, or he, they would ask questions like this. And I remember uh, our relationship got to where I asked him so many questions that he got tired of being asked questions and he decided he would take his meals in his room alone. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so then I would go up and serve the meal and try to get sit down and ask the question. And then, and then it got really bad and the only time I could get a question was traveling with him like if we were in the car together. Uh, and then he'd pretend he was asleep. Uh, but uh, we were on a flight to India. And uh, so that's a 12 hours either, either way, sometimes 20 hours in the, in the plane. And so I, and he was next to me, stuck. And uh, he couldn't pretend to sleep for 12 hours. And I asked him, if he had some advice for situations like this. And he gave me a long, he said, take, take a note, you know. He would say, take a note. And uh, he gave me uh, a long teaching. It was like three, four hours about what to do in a situation like this. And it was very beautiful. Uh, what he said was very beautiful. And he said, uh, and by the way, Su Gang's book also, uh, the, new, the new new book, uh, it has a nice section on uh, Bardo, on the Bardo. There's an appendix on the Bardo. And uh, during the Bardo, during the time between death and rebirth, uh, those beings have special powers. And they can, uh, and, and in Su Gang's book, we translated that section. So it's not some kind of, um, there's a book called Book of the Dead or something like that. Uh, 
which is not accepted by uh, by 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 the people who understand the Bardo. They, that that book is uh, what do you call it? It's just somebody made up stuff in there. So I, I would not advise you to use that or read it. I had a friend who tried to use it and spent time in a mental hospital. So I don't think it's, uh, my teacher said don't use that book. But there are, in the Abhidharma, uh, there are good, solid 2,000-year-old teachings on what happens to you uh, after you die. And, and my teacher taught that. He taught it from the Abhidharma in they say that uh, a bardo being <coughs> has special powers, and they can uh, understand all languages. Twenty-five dollars for the Yoga Sutra line about that. Never mind. <laughs> Savarutas nyanam, uh, Savarutas nyanam. They can speak. They can understand all languages, all human languages. They can understand. So they have a special karma. And if you study uh, the bardo beings' uh, habits, uh, their mental state, uh, their different powers from the Abhidharma Kosha, uh, you can, it's real. They really can understand uh, when you speak uh, to them. And uh, I had a dream like that. My college roommate died. And... Um, I was helping his wife and their two kids, and um, he died suddenly. And uh, I had a dream about him, and he was in the bardo, and he was behind a glass wall, <clears throat> and he was at his house, and he was watching his wife and their two kids eat breakfast, and he was trying to talk to them, and they couldn't hear him, but he could hear them. And he was banging on the glass because uh, he was upset because he didn't know he was dead. Uh, and they were ignoring him. And, uh, and it, it's like that. So they can hear uh, their family members and they can understand uh, when you speak. So uh, my teacher encouraged people uh, to speak to their relatives who passed away. And, uh, and he made a whole practice about it, and it's very beautiful. And I have friends who have been doing it for 20 years, 30 years. Uh, I, I taught this 20 years ago. And uh, so you can, you know, when you're alone in a room, uh, you can do it. Uh, I like to go to a park or something and sit on a park bench. Probably people think I'm an odd old man talking to himself. Uh, but I'll go to a park and sit on a bench and talk to my mom or something like that. And they can hear you and they can understand you. So uh, it's nice uh, if you want to help them. If, so what I mean is it's probably more useful for your mom if you talk to them while they're, after they died than it is to be there when they die. Uh, as the person is dying, there's very little they can, you can do for them. They cannot think straight. They cannot, uh, it's too frightening. And their sense organs are breaking down. That's not the time to talk to somebody, okay? Uh, they can understand more, they can hear more afterwards. So I wouldn't be so worried that you weren't there at the moment uh, that a person, that your mom passed away. And it's not that crucial. It, it's helpful, but it's not that crucial. You can do a lot more good <clears throat> afterwards and keep talking to them, keep encouraging them. Uh, what, what's a nice practice? What my teacher asked me to do was keep a list of things my mom had done for me and nice things she had done for me, and then thank her and talk to her. And he said, that's a really cool idea because it makes you more grateful. And it reminds her 
of the best things she has done in her life. And then we call Bachak Sepa, uh, which is the eighth and ninth limbs of the 12 links of the Wheel of Life, Gepa Sepa Gupa Limba, which means uh, if your mom can, if you talk to your mom about nice things they did for you, then she will remember and that will wake up those seeds, uh, the, the seeds that she has in her mind uh, from having helped you. When you remind her or talk to her about, you know, I remember when you took me to the surf shop and bought me the impossibly expensive five foot 11 uh, blue surfboard for $85. And it was a lot of money for us at the time. And I remember when you did that. And, and then, you know, talk to them about things they did for you. And uh, that's a lot more powerful. So I, I would say it's not a, you know, and that you can do indefinitely. You can do it for 20 years. It, it doesn't matter. And the list, if you keep a little journal about nice, nice things they did for you, uh, it gets longer and longer. In my journal was 85 pages of stuff that she had done for me. And um, so it, it's a great practice. Uh, it's a wonderful practice. And you can keep doing it. So I think it's a lot more important to do that than to be there at the moment that they pass. I think, uh, you know, it's a lot It's a lot more useful for her and for you if you do this practice of talking to her and reminding her about cool stuff she did. And that list will just keep getting longer and longer. One more, Timothy. Very right, cool. Thank you for that. So this question kind of plays off of Anna Lee's question, Eli's question from yesterday. Um, so the question is, when we think about emptiness, or we're thinking more about the, the gotcha, the thing that's not there, right? And we're doing this practice of canceling everything that's not there. And then the thing that arises is the thing that is there. The question really is, what is the seed? This, the question is, what is the seed for the mental picture at this time specifically related to emptiness? Okay. So if you're having the direct perception of emptiness, you've canceled everything that's not emptiness. But if emptiness is something that's not there that you thought was there, what is that seed? <laughs> what is the mental picture that arises in that moment? Yeah, it's good. That's a good question. Uh, it's a deep question. So um, the direct perception of emptiness is divided into two parts, uh, nyamshak yeshi and jetob yeshi. Uh, Nyamshag Yeshi means uh, samapati in Sanskrit, uh, balanced meditation. Balanced between what for $50? Chloe? <laughs> dullness and agitation. Good. Uh, between dullness and agitation, yeah. Chingwan Gupa. Did I say $5? I don't remember. I'll get 50 50. So, Nyamshak Yeshi means uh, during the actual direct perception, you are uh, focusing on the absence of an impossible thing. Okay? So, you are directly perceiving the fact that nothing is not coming from you. Okay? Uh, double negative. Okay? So, during that time, you cannot have any other perceptions. Uh, not possible. What's the most frustrating perception you cannot have at that moment? I did it. I did it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, you cannot say I did it because I is not emptiness. Uh, did it is not emptiness. Uh, it is not, well, so, uh, so then, but there's something happens in the direct perception of emptiness the power of the absence of anything that doesn't come from you, that absence 
has a specific power. Okay? The, the fact that nothing's not coming from you, okay? That fact, which is the highest thing in the universe, okay? Uh, that is the highest thing in the universe. If you, if you want to have a God, that's God. Okay, and by the way, someone reminded me it's not on, only Easter, it's Passover and Ramadan, so, uh, you know, congratulations to everybody. <laughs> it's also Easter break for Joe and the other college students. Um, just kidding. Uh, so, uh, the extreme power of seeing highest reality does something in the following, the jetop, jetop means uh, the aftermath, okay? So like the afterglow. And, and you could talk about it in yoga terms, in prana terms, chi, that for the first time, all of your prana has entered the central channel. All the chi is in the jongmai. And, uh, and it, for the first time, and when you come down out of the direct perception in the 20 minutes or so, uh, the chi is still there uh, in unprecedented qu quantity in the central channel. It's not going to leave the central channel the moment you come out of shamatha. So it stays there for about 24 hours. Uh, and... Because of that, you have extraordinary normal perceptions, which are not emptiness. And those are called the 16 aspects of the Arya, for, for higher truth, for Arya truth. And they include, for example, seeing directly the day of your death. So nobody really believes they're going to die except an Arya, because an Arya has seen it directly. Uh, they have seen... For an Arya, they don't say die, they say uh, on the day that gravity wins the contest. <laughs> okay? Like, you are a weird animal that walks upright. I was thinking about it yesterday, I went for a long walk, and uh, all the animal paths here are frustrating because they go under trees and under bushes. Animals are, are only this high. So you can't really follow the animal paths here because they go under everything. You see what I mean? Human beings are one of the few creatures that compete with gravity their whole life. You know, they struggle to learn to walk and to, to stand up unnaturally, vertically. And then uh, sooner or later that contest is won by gravity. And an Arya has seen that. They have seen directly the day of their death. By the way, they've also seen where they are going afterwards. So they, they're kind of like, okay, you know, uh, they know what's coming next. So, uh, and then, of course, they have this perception of uh, bodhicitta. They have actual bodhicitta, real bodhicitta. And they meet every living being. And they, they've gone through the Dakshan Yamje, right? They've been through that practice. Number, which of the five list? Exchanging myself and others? Number four, okay. Step number four. So they've been through that. They know how to do it. They meet every living being directly. So, uh, so the aftermath, when the prana is still in the central channel, uh, is a lot of not direct perceptions of emptiness. They are normal perceptions. They are abnormal, but supernormal, but they are not the direct perception of emptiness. And the things they see are positive things and not an absence of something. So it's different, right? Uh, so that's the main thing. You, you, that's the relationship between an unchanging negative object, emptiness, and then all of those 16 aspects of the four truths. For example, seeing your death, seeing where you're headed after that, uh, meeting every living being. Uh, those, those are fallout. You can say fallout of, from the experience, okay? And those are normal perceptions of, of changing objects, positive objects, okay? Does that, does that help? So the direct perception of something that's not there leads to many 
uh, subsequent, jetot means subsequent uh, perceptions of high changing truths. Okay, cool. Does that, does that cover that question? I guess so. That's how I want to cover it. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go back to the text, okay? Um, I'm really making an attempt to finish this book before 2080 or something. All right. Shiba Dakshan Jewe Sambanguni. Ngo means uh, now I'm going to give you the real thing, okay? So finally, Pabon Rinpoche also is getting down to it, all right? And he says, here's part four. Here's how to exchange yourself and others, okay? Narakin uh, yun la samba. Kyun yun la samba means, look, we finished thinking about the kyuns, and we finished thinking about the yuns. He's making a, a, alliteration? Yeah. So anyway, kyun means problems of trying to, the, yeah, the useless attempt to take care of yourself first. You know, and again, you can keep doing it as long as you want. It's hopeless. It doesn't work. Okay, so, but if you, okay, you wanna, you wanna have a miserable life, keep doing it. You know, keep trying to take care of yourself first. Okay, uh, then yun, yun ten, guna, good qualities. You know, just let go and focus on other people's needs. Your needs will get covered automatically. Don't worry about it, you know. Just get in the habit of seeing what the people around you need and accommodate it. It doesn't mean, I, I don't buy this sacrifice thing, that you have to sacrifice your happiness and work on other people's happiness. It's unnatural. Nobody will do it, okay? It just happens to be, luckily, that when you focus on what other people need, that's how you... That's the happiest thing you can do. So that's lucky it works out that way. You don't have to make a choice between what you want and what other people want. You just have to get really good at synthesizing the two so that you can get everything you want and they get everything they want. And that's a happy ending for everybody, okay? All right, so Samba de Tabutakne, okay? Now that we've discussed how hopeless it is to try to take care of yourself first all the time, Rangni Chenzinki Chongne Di, Rangni Chepanzimbe Chongne Di, he says, you should think about those four verses. And then he gives the first line of 16 lines. And he says, everybody knows the rest. Uh, okay. The line he quotes is a rangni chepa zimbe chongne. Chongne means a, what do you call that? Mm, a, 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 a cough that won't go away for years. Chronic, chronic cough or something like that. You, did you ever have one for like two years or something? I don't know. There's, there's chronic things that happen to you. If you're lucky, they go away after a year or two, but you just cough for a year or you cough for two years. You go to the doctor and they say, yeah, you have a cough. And you're like, I know I have a cough. <laughs> well, that'll be $100. You're like, what? <laughs> and uh, so it's this thing that won't go away, okay? What's the thing that won't go away? Rang ni chen zin. Chronic, chronic habit of thinking about what you want. So he, he doesn't call it bad habit or something like that. He calls it a chronic disease. He says the chronic disease of the chronic disease of taking care of yourself first. Okay. Uh, so you being great students, I figure you want the whole four verses. Uh, don't listen to Tim. Okay. Uh, Sugang, you got to picture for me, I think, though. Uh, it's the cover of the Three Treasures prayer book, okay? You guys, did you find it? No? Yes? 
Anyway, it's there. Okay, don't worry about it. Let's do the let's do the four lines. Let's do the four verses. Uh, he, what he's quoting is the uh, Lama Chupa, which you did the first night here. Okay, it's called the offering to Lama. Uh, that's the first prayer I ever sat in. I, I arrived in the Himalayas on a bus. I went to this Tibetan library. It was just open for foreigners, and uh, there was like 20 monks there doing Lama Chupa. I walked into Lama Chupa. It's the first thing I ever heard. And uh, here's the first verse. Rangni Chepan Zimbe Chong Nin Di Mindu Dunga Kipi Gyur Tong Ne Lelen De La Kundu Sung Che Te Dang Shin Dun Shin Jong Bar Ching Kilob. Rangni Chepan Zimbe Chong Ne Di This chronic disease of taking care of myself first. Mindu Dunga Kipi Gyur Tong Ne if you suddenly wake up and see it's giving you all the problems you ever had, Leland De means, Leland De is a very rare Tibetan word that means uh, you figure out who's really causing you trouble. What do you call that? You put the blame on the right person. There's a saying in English. Yeah, you could say that. Something like that. I mean, you just wake up and you say, oh, that, oh, all these years, that's what's been messing me up. You know, you're like, you put the blame in the right place. Leland De means, Len means uh, the blame, okay? Leland De, la kundu sung. And then he says, I want you to feel kun. Kun means, uh, kunzin means, what is it when someone hurts you over and over again and you start getting, like, Huh? Resent. Resent, yeah. Yeah, that's kun. Kun means, uh, it's funny because here's the Buddhist teacher saying, please feel resentful. <laughs> you know, please feel resentment for what? He says the dun chen means the great demon. Taking care of myself first. He said, I want you to feel I want you to develop resentment. You know, you have been ruining my life, my whole life, and I'm, fat, I'm so sick of you. And now I finally figured out there's this sense of discovery in this verse. Ha! Aha! Sherlock! You know, <laughs> that's what's been messing me up my whole life. You know, and you're like, aha! I figured it out, you know, and then you're like, God, you're such an asshole, you know, to, to give me this trouble my whole life, you know, and then you, he's like cursing here, like, it's not me, okay, uh, he's like, you should say, you asshole, I figured it out, you're the one who's been causing me all this trouble, it's supposed to be a verse of discovery and resentment, okay, dang jin dun chen jong bar jing Please best bless me to murder this guy. Who? My habit of taking care of myself first. Okay. That's the first verse, okay? Manam chesung de la gope lo, taye yun den jung me go tong ne, go a di da daki da lang kyang, so la chepa zimba jingi lo. Manam chesung de la gope lo. This is chepa zimba, okay, past tense. Taking care of my moms, okay? Taking care of my moms. Uh, now I figured it out. It's the sweetest thing I can do with my life. It's the most fun, sweet thing to do in my life. It's just look at what other people need, what other people want, help them get what they want, help them get what they need. And that's the sweetest way to live a human life. And it's so satisfying, and it's so sexy, and it's so fun, okay? And then he's like, this is also a verse of discovery. Whoa, I just figured out what's really fun is taking care of other people, what they want, you know, and, and doing that first. Uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll take care of myself. I'll get there. 
by the way, it's, it's not uh, giving up anything. He's just saying, take care of everybody, okay? And you're, you're one of everybody, so don't worry about it. We'll cover you. You cover everybody, you got yourself covered. Okay, then he says something hard. If everybody in the world decided they hate your guts, okay, right, okay. like uh, you have the karma to be trolled by everybody online. Okay, Sokle Chepa Zimba Jingelo, may you bless me, my Lama, to love them even more. You know, more than my own life. Sokle means my, my own life. Even if I get trolled by the whole world at one, uh, please bless me that I will cherish those trollers even more than my own life. Okay, that's, boy, not easy. Okay. Third verse. Dorna chiba rangdun konadang. To Wang Shen Dun Bashik Zeba Yi Kyun Dang Yin Dang Yi Wei Do Bei Lu Dak Shen Yim Jin Nu Ba Jing Yi Long Do Na Chi Ba Rang Dun Kong Na Dang What's a Chi Ba? Bala in Sanskrit. Yeah, kid, two year old. We have this derogatory connotation in English. He's acting like a two year old. You know. I've never spent time around little kids because I never had them, but. I've been around my dream. When he hit two, it, it was a little difficult. Uh, that's when I kicked him out of the studio at DCI. Uh, so Chiba Rang Denkona means, uh, Chiba in Buddhism is a, two-year-old is an insult uh, for people who are selfish, who take care of themselves first. It's also a synonym for Someone who has not seen emptiness directly. Probably the two are very connected, can we say? Seriously, if you don't see emptiness, you're more likely to take care of yourself first. There's a connection there. We got to talk more about it. Okay. But Buddhists, they just focus on everything that other people need. May I come to the realization of the difference, okay? Yewa means uh, bless me to realize the difference between a two-year-old and a being who sees all objects in the universe. Duh. <laughs> okay? It's like, bless me to see the difference between a two selfish little two-year-old and a Buddha who sees all objects in the universe. You know, please bless, I don't know why you need a blessing to see that, but uh, please bless me to get the, to get the difference, okay? Don't pay le. And, and with that understanding, bless me to dakshen nyamje. Bless me to do the practice of, when you say dakshen nyamje, it's two different things, okay? Never call it exchanging only. Call it Equal rights. They want to say equalizer. It sounds like a battery to me. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, may I, may I come to the understanding that everybody has an equal right to happiness? And then may I exchange myself and others, which doesn't mean what you think it does. And I just decided at this very moment, it's been cooking in my mind, Tim. He doesn't go to Shanti Deva. He doesn't do the classic nyamje. Uh, so we better, you know, slight detour uh, to get the correct details. Okay. Uh, all right. But that's another story for later in the week. Dakshin uh, nyamje. So please bless me. Once I figured out the difference between a two year old and a being who sees every object in the universe. Therefore, I should do Dakshin Yamji. That's weird, right? Got, got it? Because I understand the difference between a two-year-old who just focuses on what they want, and two-year-olds do, by the way, except Maitri, who always feeds people. 
bless me to see the difference between these two people. Therefore, let me exchange myself and others. You, what's the logic there? Why does one follow from the other? That's something you have to think about. Okay, okay last verse. Rangni Chenzin Guba Kungi Go. This is... Uh, this is a very, very famous summary uh, from the Lama Chippa of these ideas, okay? Here's the most famous verse uh, summarizing these ideas. Rangni Chenzin Guba Kungi Go. Taking care of myself first was the door to every problem I ever had in my whole life. Every problem I've ever had in my whole life, sooner or later, it can be traced back to trying to take care of myself first. What's the next verse going to say? Yeah, the, the opposite. Manam chinsen yun den kungi shi. Taking care of others is the foundation of all good qualities. By the way, he's making a pun, Buddhist pun here. He's writing in the 1600s, I think. First pension lama. And he says, Yunden Kungi Shi. Aya. Source of all my good. Okay? He says, The source of all my good is thinking of my mother's first. You know? And he's making a pun because that's that famous poem by Jetsam Kaba. We're working on a new version of that book, by the way. So that was called Preparing for Tantra. And I think we're going to change it to Door to the Diamond Way or something like that. Okay. Day chair, Dakshan Jewe, Nyan Jorla, Nyamla Nyingbo, Chepa Jingilo. Therefore, let me study yoga. Okay. Nyan Jor here is yoga, it's the Tibetan word for yoga. Jor is obvious because that means to join, like huge, the Sanskrit root huge, which means to join oxen on a yoke or, or yoga practice, right? But here he says, uh, now, now, I mean, now Jor is the Tibetan translation of yoga, the, word, Tibet, the Sanskrit word yoga. Jor is easy, it means to connect. But now means accurately. So the word for uh, the word for yoga in Tibetan is accurate practice, accurate ac accurate application of myself to my practice. How's that? That's the Tibetan word for yoga. Okay. What's the yoga here? Dakshen J. Exchanging myself and others. So, what did he leave out there? Yam. He fin he, we finish with the equal thing. Let's go to the Dakshan Yamba. Let's, sorry, Jewa. So by the way, you can say Dakshan Yamje is Dakshan Yamba and Dakshan Jewa. It's two different practices. Dakshan Yamje is two different practices. Dakshan Yamba and Dakshan Jewa. Recognize equal right to happiness and then exchange what I want with others what others want, okay, like that. Two different practices. You can't do the jewa without the nyama. You can't exchange yourself and others without recognizing that they have rights also. Okay, cool. Nyamlan nyingba jepa jingilo. Please bless me to make this nyamlan nyingbo. Please bless me to be smart enough to make this my main practice. Okay, it's a very beautiful line. The last line is very beautiful. Please bless me to be smart enough spiritually to make it my main practice to take care of what other people want. And by the way, just as a, as a way of life, it's very, very satisfying. Okay, it's very, very uh, enjoyable when you get good at it. Uh, just watching what other people want, what other people need. Um, it's a very sweet life. It's a very, very cool, nice way to live. It's, you're, you feel good all day long. Okay? It, it's a great, it's a great, it's no sacrifice. It's a pleasure. Okay? All right. Mm.
Next picture, you guys got pictures for me? Yeah, I was trying to find a picture of exchanging, and that's the best I could come up with. I don't know, you could read something into the square, I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a Tibetan word called kosa poa. Say kosa. Kosa. Poa. Kosa. Poa. Kosa means uh, the position that you occupy. So in an election, uh, kosa means a position, like a political position, uh, like a presidency or a, to be a senator or something is a kosa. And that's the classic meaning of kosa. But kosa boa, boa means, you know, poa, like chi poa, uh, die and move on. Boa, move on to your next life, okay? Here it means switch you and the other person, okay? Switch, switch positions, how's that? Exchange positions, okay? And the exchange is very important in this section of the Lamrim. Learn to exchange positions. He's gonna say uh, in the next paragraph, it's like for the first time, if you uh, go up to the dome here, it's a beautiful walk, by the way. Go from the Lama house up to the dome and uh, see if you can catch Tim in his underwear or something. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, I never look in the window. I just go up to the dome and there's a, bal there's a sweet balcony there. You can oversee the whole valley. And you can see across about the same elevation is uh, the little tiny cabin up on the end here, up way high. I don't know if you've ever been in there. It's got a compost toilet that's very similar to a Volkswagen. <laughs> like, to get on top of it, you gotta do yoga. <laughs> uh, I, I, lived, I lived there, I mean, I, I had the, they built it for me. And I stayed there one night, and, and uh, I've never been back. Uh, but uh, they're on the same elevation, and uh, it's one thing to go up on the dome and look at that little cabin straight across, and then the retreat valley is like that. But then uh, if you climb down from the dome and walk down and then climb up to the little cabin, and forget these numbers, I hate these numbers. Like they so say, where are you staying? Cabin 13. I'm like, last week that was cabin eight. And in my time it was cabin four. And I'm like, I, I get, anyway, climb up there and look at the dome. You see what I mean? And that's what he, he says, if you wanna know what Dakshin Yamje feels like, go up to the dome, stand there, enjoy the view. And then go down, walk across the valley, walk up to this other mountain at the same height and look back at the dome. And that's what Dakshin Yamje feels like. That's what exchanging yourself with others feels like. And he, he says, if you want the feeling of it, do, do it a couple times. To pick two mountains, not too high, okay? And uh, go walk to the other one and look back at the first one. And you get the feeling that that's how it's supposed to feel when you do Dakshin Yamde. So you're looking back at yourself, okay? And we'll talk more about it. It's a, it's a little bit weird. Okay. Kenyan Tongwe Gone Rang Chepitzimbe Lono, Shenya Wadoi Lonyi, Kosa Poa, Dakshin Yamja. Exchanging self and others doesn't refer to. Uh, doesn't refer to you pretend to be Geshe Michael or something like that. It doesn't mean that. He says, he makes a point about it. He says, it doesn't mean you, you try to pretend to be Geshe Michael or something. It doesn't mean that. But what you have to exchange is the, is the feeling of who you're supposed to take care of. You're not exchanging yourself and others. You're exchanging the feeling of who you're supposed to take care of with the old feeling of who you're supposed to take care of. Got it? You're, you're not supposed to switch out your hair for my hair because you don't want to do that. Uh, what you want to do is switch out 
your feeling about who's, who you should be taking care of. That's all. Okay? It doesn't mean you try to pretend to look like Geshe Michael or something like that. Uh, it means you switch out your feeling of who you should take. Who's priority? Who gets priority when you're deciding who to take care of? Okay? You switch the priorities. You don't switch the people. Gosapo, Dakshen, Dakshen, Deyang Shen, Dak Dan, Dakshen to Sampa Min means I'm not saying you should pretend to be Rob and Rob pretends to be you. I'm not saying that. Na Rang Chepersen be Sung Ne Shen Yao or Do Yimbala. In the old days, you used to try to focus on what you wanted, and then you kind of paid attention to what other people wanted, but it was secondary. Uh, so it's not like you ignored people completely, but it was secondary. It, it was a good thing to do after you took care of yourself. He says, you are, now you have to switch that attitude out. Da deni gosan dok means flip it. Gosan dok means flip it. Rang chepa zimba de shen What you want to exchange is who you're taking care of first. Okay, uh, that's that's exchanging self and others, okay? It's, it's exchanging attitudes and not exchanging identities. Cool? Okay. You're not supposed to look like Geshe Michael. You don't want to look like Geshe Michael. All right. Now he says something difficult, and I want you to think about it today, okay? Uh, in, your, in your retreat while you're doing retreat, okay? While you're in your cabin, off your phone, give your phone a rest. You don't need a rest from the internet. Your phone needs a rest from the internet, okay? So respect your phone before you respect yourself. Take care of your phone. He's tired. He's exchanging electrons relentlessly, seven, average 7.5 hours a day, right? Give him a, let him take a rest. Okay. Uh, try, this is a hard instruction. Okay, listen and tell me what you think. Okay, and, and, and I'm open to, I'm not sure about this line. I'm not sure if I accept it. Okay, tell me what you think. Or tell me how you think we should read it. You ready? Jack. Uh, he says, uh, in days gone by, uh, I would take care of myself first. And if others had to slide, I let it happen. Okay? Like I took care of myself for sure, first. And then, then second, I would take care of other people. But if, but if I didn't really have time to take care of them as well as I took care of myself, it was okay. If, what do you call that? If, if their needs kind of sli slided, you know, if, if I didn't quite get done what they needed done, I was okay. As long as I got done what I needed done, then it's not like I ignored them completely, okay? Like I was worried about other people's welfare. But if it wasn't done with quite the enthusiasm that my own welfare was done with, then it's always okay, you know? Okay, got it? That's called Yawar Noah. Mm. He says, now I want you to do that to yourself. Okay, so by the time you sleep, at the end of the day, I want you to make sure that what other pe people needed got done. And what you needed maybe didn't get done. Tim says I should slow down for the translators. You know if the translators just could learn to read my mind and... <laughs> and translate it before I said it. We, maybe you could work towards that. Um, okay, no, I'm kidding. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sure I buy this. I'll say it again, and then I want to hear your opinion. Okay, ready? He says, in the past, by the end of the day, you took care of the most important stuff for you, and then Oftentimes, that didn't leave enough time to take care of what other people needed as well as what you needed. 
or to finish them as completely as you did what you needed, okay? Now he says, now he has a proposal. Uh, let your own stuff slide, and by the end of the day, make sure you have taken care of what other people need. Okay. And, and I'm not sure I buy it. What do you think? Anjali, talk loud. Don't do, don't do this. Let other people sl- slide. You have to talk. Go ahead. Talk loud. Um, you've you've taught us in the past that uh, way back that if you're going to be a good mother to children, you have to take care of mom. Mom has to take care of mom a little bit in order to be able to take care of the kids. So I, I don't know, I like that feeling about that. It's important, you know, otherwise if mother slides, then they can't take care of everyone, yeah. for the, the kids, I guess. Yeah. Any, I, that's kind of what I feel, but anybody else? Sheree, did you have something? I think Sheree had something. Go ahead, don't do, the, don't do this yourself another thing. <laughs> I was going to say it might be that by taking care of everyone else throughout the day, when you come to the end of the day, you may find that your own needs have already been taken care of. Say the, say the last part again. By the time you get to the end of the day, after taking care of everyone, you may find that what you need is already taken care of in yeah, the process. No. Okay. I like, I'll buy that one. Yeah. <laughs> Tim had one. You need a box. I think the, because you said yesterday, you talked about the 50-50, right? Where we don't necessarily, we do want to pay attention to our own needs as well while we're paying attention to others. But I think here he's saying because we've had such a terrible habit of taking care of ourselves, maybe swinging to the other side first would be a good practice to then be able to come back to the middle. Yeah, I I also, I I was thinking that yesterday. We have to overcompensate uh, because we've been biased towards ourselves for so long that what feels like overcompensation is probably halfway. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I like that one too. Anybody else? Yeah. I just wanted to comment on that. I've seen students who seem to swing drastically to caring for others, and then what happens is they have a breakdown, and they can no longer care for others. So there's got to be this, I think the 50-50 balance, there's got to be a balance in there. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Rebecca? Well, I was just thinking about what you said yesterday about having the ability to bend time and space. So ultimately, you have to be able to do both, I think. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Joe, please. I'd say uh, do it for a couple of months and see how it turns out. (laughs) Other people need to plant seeds. And someone, we need to be there so that someone can plant uh, their caring seeds in us. Yeah. So that's way we help other people. And if yeah. we do it all ourselves, if we plan our life ourselves, take care of ourselves, we don't leave space for others to take care of us. So we don't help them. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that's good. Um, because uh, till now I have not see, have not seen the di- uh, direct perception of the emptiness. This means that I still have the fact of Bodhisattva, and uh, I think I must take myself uh, until I see the emptiness directly, because that is the time I got uh, the true Bodhisattva, and that is the time I can jump in the all the worlds and love them ultimately. And uh, that is why uh, I must take care of myself until I'm 
become a Buddha because when I was a Buddha, uh, all my worlds uh, can enjoy the protection of a Buddha paradise. Mm. I was in a position last night to make the choice of take care of somebody else or take care of my needs to finish the day. And I, I realized, oh my God, what a wonderful opportunity to learn how to manage uh, these choices a little differently so that I can you know, help both them and myself. I was moving furniture, it was late. My friend needed tax advice on the phone. So I said, <laughs> while you are looking for the tax line, you have the question on it, I'm gonna push this heavy thing. <laughs> and then uh, I'll push the cabinet while you're looking for the tax line. Tell me when you find it. I'll stop pushing the chest and answer the question. So it was a wonderful opportunity to figure out different management approaches to taking care of both of us at the end of the day. Annie Amy laughed. Good. You're kind of doing both, right? On the point that Venerable Gil say, uh, said about balance, when you want to do something for yourself, first do something for somebody else. 50-50. Yeah. Before you do something, you do something for another person. Okay, cool. That's cool. Uh, one last thing. Did some, mm. So my proposal, okay. And uh, just something, I, I was teaching in Japan at our new university. There's an MBA program, so we were having some of the first classes. And they asked me to teach in a, there's a course called uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And uh, so I was supposed to teach one of those classes along with a Western professor. And it, it's, it's a sweet uh it's a sweet university because I have to teach classes with Western professors. And, um, and it, it's actually working out really cool because uh, they come with their big, thick book about innovation. and Some of them have never been in business. You know what I mean? So anyway, uh, but uh, it forced me to think about innovation. And then I was, uh, I, I chose some of the innovations I made in the diamond business. And, and one of the reasons we succeeded uh, among, I think there's 10,000 diamond companies. The, the reason we were number one, I think, was that we had all these innovations. We had very weird innovations, some of which are still secret, uh, of how to process diamonds and how to make jewelry and you know, and I was thinking about those innovations and they were all done during retreat, all of them, you know, and ACI, ALL started in one of those retreats. Uh, so the innovations in my life, uh, which, which made the company the, the largest in the world for diamond jewelry, uh, and Warren Buffett bought it in 2009, um, what what made those innovations was certain kinds of retreats done here and other places uh, at Diamond Mountain. So I, we were talking, Tim and I were talking about um, in Sonamla about doing an innovation retreat here maybe of training people to be innovative uh, through retreat, how to use retreat time to be innovative even just in your business life but you could also use it for your family challenges, right? So I think this idea of when you have a problem or when you have a challenge, to, to solve it by going into retreat, it's kind of cool. And uh, I've been watching this Christian TV show, uh, The Chosen, right? That seems to be what Jesus did. Whenever he had a big challenge, he'd, he'd tell all his disciples, he'd say, go away. There's, I love it. They say, where are, you, where are you going? He says, you don't need to know. And, and he says, I'll be back. And they say, where? And he says, you don't need to know. 
you know? I said, they're saying, like, what city are you going to come back to? He says, you don't need to know. You'll find out, you know? And uh, so his reaction to a problem is to go into a retreat, you know? And then, uh, and then to think of some innovative solution in retreat. And I think to have a, like a course where you teach people how to be innovative by doing retreat, uh, how to do an innovation retreat, I think it, it'd be something that we're gonna try out here, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll let you know more. Why am I saying that? Why am I saying that? You tell me, why am I saying that? Yeah, be innovative in pleasing both yourself and others. Okay, find, find super innovative solutions to get everything you want done and take care of everyone else, what they need done at the same time. And to me, that's one of the greatest skills you can learn in a human life. You know, and I, I'm, I'm saying it from age 70, right? It's a wonderful skill to have. Uh, to find solutions to other people's needs and your needs to find these grand solutions that, that, that give the other people exactly what they need and they give you exactly what you need at the same time. And in, in my opinion, if you can learn that skill, your whole life is really fun, extremely fun. Uh, to learn that skill, that kind of innovation where you you'd make a decision that other getting other people what they need is now priority. Getting, getting other people what they need is now priority in my life. But it's also important for me to get some stuff that I want, <laughs> you know? And it's a lot more fun to uh, come up with solutions that make both happen at the same time. And, and I think you can learn to do that. I think you can be trained to do that. And I think it'd be fun to have a retreat based, just to have a special retreat of, I would call it an innovation retreat or something, or a creativity retreat. And uh, I think it would be a beautiful skill to teach people. So we're talking with Diamond Mountain and ACI to do it here, uh, some kind of innovation retreat, like how to be innovative about how you satisfy what you want and what everyone else wants at the same time in some kind of grand solution that gives both parties more than they wanted. They asked me to teach a different course there, which is negotiation. And uh, it's a similar uh, skill. You know, a real successful business negotiator comes up with solutions that favor both parties, and they create advantages for both parties. And that's, that's real negotiation. Uh, somebody wrote a book in the United States called The Art of the Deal or something like that. The whole, the whole premise was that you should get what you want, and they shouldn't get what they want. And to me, that's the most idiotic thing I ever heard of. Uh, you know, real negotiation should be mutual. What do you call it? Both parties get more than what they expected when they got into the deal. Both parties should get much more than they wanted when they started negotiating. That's, that's a negotiation. So I was thinking we could do these business, uh, we could do business retreats here and it'd be fun. Because uh, it's all, we're writing new books on these subjects for the university. I'm writing new books for the university for these topics. And I think it'd be fun to, uh, I think it'd be fun for ACI and, and Diamond Mountain to, to have retreats just with that theme. Like negotiation or, or how, to, how to get both parties more than what they want, okay? Like that, I think it'd be cool. Uh, innovation, to be innovative, truly innovative, you know. Uh, and and in my business life, uh, 
why why that company we went from three people to 10,000 people we doubled every 18 months for 19 years uh, we hired equals if we have 500 staff we hire 500 staff within six months it's incredible uh, and I think it was uh, the retreats it was the retreats that 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 did it, okay? So I think, uh, I don't know, Dakshin Yemje retreat, something like that. Mutual benefit negotiation training retreat. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you get used to it, he says, you can learn to do the exchange, right? Uh, if you get used to it. Berna, pari la dupa na suri dope lo juma tabuyin so. For example, if you go stand on one mountain and then run over to the other mountain and look back at the mountain you are standing on, I'm going too fast, too, I'm sorry. That's where he says, the, he gives the mountain suggestion. Okay. All right, uh, we got five minutes. My teacher taught me never to waste five minutes. Uh, Napa, what's Napa? What's, what is fire? Tonglen. He says, let's go to Tonglen. We have five minutes. I'm going to start Shanti Deva's version of Dakshin Yamje, okay? And it's not in the Lamrim, and I don't care. Uh, but here it is. Uh, maybe I can finish it. Uh, and then I want you to try it today in your meditations, okay? And uh, this is how it, no, it's too much to tell you. In, I'll tell you the first part today, and I'll tell you the, the rest tomorrow, okay? Uh, so if it's me, I would start with someone on your own level, like at work, okay? So someone who's a colleague, not your boss and not your employee, someone who's on the same level as you, okay? So it's a coworker or a colleague in your, whatever your job is, it's your colleague, okay? They are not your superior, and they don't report to you. They are your colleague, equal, they're equal to you, okay? And then uh, being colleagues in an organization uh, implies the possibility for jealousy or competitiveness, okay? It's human nature. Uh, when you're at the same level as another person, uh, there's a tendency towards competitiveness, okay? Which then uh, implies, and here's the nasty part, when you start with competitiveness, where you go to is the wish that the other person should fail, okay? And uh, jealousy or competitiveness uh, involves the desire that the other person should fail, okay? Uh, if you're competing with your colleague at work to see who can make the most sales for the month, and they suddenly break their leg and can't sell anything for a couple of weeks, there's this kind of sick pleasure, you know? There's this kind of sick feeling that, oh, gee, I'm so sorry you broke your leg, you know. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so, so competitiveness uh, between equals, that's the natural state of people. Uh, now, here's what's the real exchange of self and others, okay? Here's the real one. Ready? Yes, you put yourself in their shoes. That part's, that part's correct that you do the first part of this practice, the first half of this practice is what you think it is when you hear exchange self and others, okay? Yes, you do put yourself in their shoes, okay? So that part, what you always thought was exchanging self and others, that part is correct. The first half is correct. You do put yourself, in English, in American English, we say put yourself in the other person's shoes. It means uh, think of how they feel, okay? 
and and that's 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 only the first half of exchanging self and others. Okay, got it? Can anybody guess what the second half is? And that's what we haven't. That's what he doesn't talk about in the lumberman. Yeah. Look at yourself then. After yeah. You put good. Yourself. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what he doesn't make clear in the long rim. Shanti Deva says it's not enough to try to think how they're feeling. It's not enough. He says, put yourself in their shoes and look back at yourself and see how it feels when someone else is praying that you will break your leg and not make the sales this month. You know, see how bad that feels. And it's a very depressing meditation. If you don't get depressed from exchanging self and others, you're not doing it right. <laughs> okay? It's to look back at you. That's the important part, okay? Shanti Deva says, it's not enough to just try to imagine how Kat's feeling right now. Probably her bottom's sore. Maybe you should end on time, Geshe-la. <laughs> That's not enough. You, know? you have to sit in Kat's body, look through Kat's eyes at Geshe Michael, you know, bombasting on past the end time when everyone's butt is sore. Doesn't he get it? Doesn't he see how we feel? What's wrong with him? You know, and, and that's where you're supposed to go with Dakshin Yamji. Okay, that's traditional. Okay, and, and now uh, I'm going to give you homework. Okay, Shanti Deva takes it one more step. Okay, A, exchange yourself and others. Yes, okay. Try to understand cat's bottom might be sore right now. Okay, step two. Look back at yourself through cat's eyes and see how she feels about you when you're, not, when you're abusing the time. Okay, and then here's the one I want you to work on, and I'd like to hear your results tomorrow. Okay, got it? Here's your assignment. Okay. Do it for three levels. Do it for three levels. Exchange with someone who's higher than you in authority, like Sunu. Okay. Like the boss of Diamond Mountain. Like, exchange yourself with the boss. And then exchange yourself with someone who's at your own level. And then exchange yourself with, yeah, someone who's working for you on the food chain. You know, they report to you. Okay. Uh, if you don't have anybody reporting to you, there's lots of, what do you call them, foxes, <laughs> javelinas. You know, how, <laughs> how does it feel to work for you? Okay, that's a great one if you're a boss of anybody. How does it feel to work for you? And and how 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 does it feel? How does it feel to look at Geshe Michael when you look for Geshe, when you work for Geshe Michael? How 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 does it what do they think when they look at you? And and that's the real Shantadevian thing, okay? Exchange yourself and others at three levels and see how it feels. And I, I wanna know tomorrow what you come up with, okay? what you come up with. Uh, what are the main emotional themes of working for you? Okay? What are the main emotional themes of being your colleague? And what are the main emotional themes of being your boss? Okay? How does it feel? Okay? Cool? Tomorrow, that's your homework. That's your meditation homework. I suggest you do it on different meditations. Don't try to do all three in one sitting. Do three sittings, okay? So for three sittings, I don't care how long, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, okay? Three sittings before tomorrow, somebody who's your boss, somebody who's your colleague, and someone who works for you. Okay, got it? Cool. All right, Timothy, anything, any announcements? Don't forget your free eBooks. <coughs> And 
if you get excited about the free ones, maybe you want to buy some of the, the better ones. Just kidding.